Hey everyone, it's Steve with another episode of Keep Em Rollin' and I'm going to do a recent pickup video. It has been a long time since I've done a recent pickup video and I was able to do this because I was able to attend a military show today. It has been also a long time of buying anything. Um, in fact, even this show I didn't think was going to take place. I live in a state that uh, we've been locked down pretty hard for this uh, COVID pandemic thing. And in fact, that's why I just haven't been buying things is because um, the places that I would normally go to, they've been uh, canceled. You know, uh, the couple big antique uh, shows that I would go to throughout the kind of spring, summer and fall were canceled. Um, you have the gun shows canceled. Um, there's a big antique fair that takes place every like fourth Sunday throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, that was canceled. Um, you have a couple big flea markets that uh, I would go to that those were canceled. Antique shops being closed, military shows being canceled, garage sales not really taking place in great quantity, uh, estate sales just not taking place. So it's been a rather dry year for um, shopping, even like my summer vacation. Usually I go with my family down to Florida and we visit uh, my parents and, and I do some antiquing down there and we were unable to make that trip this year, which was really, you know, interesting, you know, kind of in a sad sort of way. You know, I miss seeing my family. And I'm sure all of you have your own unique and strange stories in regards to this pandemic that's taking place. Um, this show itself, I really was not holding out high hopes it was going to take place. We're seeing some spikes here uh, with the pandemic um, in uh, my state of Michigan. And, you know, they're talking about locking things down again. I wouldn't be surprised if by midweek to end week this week uh, that we go back into some sort of closed uh, type of situation. And, you know, with this show, I was watching their website. Literally every day I was, you know, clicking on it, seeing if the show had been canceled. In fact, yesterday, which was Saturday, um, we gave them a call and saying, hey, are you still planning on doing it? And they were like, yep, uh, we haven't received any mandate from the health department or from the governor, etc. So we're going to hold it. Uh, the hall that we're in hasn't canceled on us. So the show took place. Uh, today, Sunday, I made the drive over to Livonia, Michigan. Um, it's a about a two-hour drive for me and spent the uh, morning going through the show. It's a small show, but it's a mighty show. Lots of really kind of fun stuff to dig through and look at. Uh, I believe I was like, I was drunk with this desire to buy things. I had to be really careful because it was like I walked in there and it's just like, there's military stuff that I can buy. Oh my goodness. It was, you know, let me just throw money at you. I'll take everything. So I had to kind of rein myself in. And, you know, and I know we have eBay and we have online shopping, but I'm a big fan of in-person shopping. That's how I built my collection and that's what I love doing. So it was, I had to be careful. And then uh, on the way back, we stopped at a small museum um, in a place called Grass Lake, Michigan. And it's just a fantastic museum, just packed full of, you know, great World War II stuff. Um, I'll have to do a video on that. I wasn't planning on stopping there today, so I really wasn't prepared to shoot a video. Uh, but I'll have to do a video on that so you guys can kind of see what they have. But some really cool stuff. So uh, let's get to the recent finds. And I want to give a shout out to John Boy 09 If you don't watch John Boy 09s channel, check him out. He does a lot of great stuff with Militaria and World War II uh, collectibles and so forth and so on. And whenever he does a recent find type of video, he always does it in his dining room. And I thought, you know, I'm going to give that a try on how he sets things up because it's a nice space just to kind of spread out here. And that's what I've done. So shout out to you, John Boy 09 Thanks for the idea. So let's get right to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Here are the items that I picked up today. Not a whole lot. Like I said, I kind of reined myself in as I was looking at items, but I think I found some pretty cool things. So we're going to begin right here with this armband. And it's just a pretty standard armband. It stands for United States National Army. And this is an armband that would have been worn by, from what I have been told and from what I've been able to uh, find in research, it was an armband that would have been worn by soldiers 
uh, who had joined the United States National Army. Basically, that's what part of our military force was referred to in 1917-ish. Um, you had like the National Guard, you had the regular army, and then you had the uh, the draftees, etc. So United States National Army, and I might have that a little off. So all right, we interrupt this video for a quick update. United States National Army, it is correct. It's kind of this third group under this umbrella. You had the uh, Federal Army or the regular army, you had the National Guard, and then you had the United States National Army. And the government decided they would increase numbers of the regular army, they would increase numbers of the National Guard, and they would create this United States National Army made up of draftees to meet the current emergency known as World War I. Uh, the purpose of the armband, it is believed that it would be given to new recruits when they arrived and had not yet been issued their uniforms. They would wear the armband showing that they were now in the United States National Army. This would disappear around 1918, kind of mid-ish, if you will, uh, when all of these groups fell under the official title of United States Army. So just kind of a unique piece of uh, U.S. history that lasted only just a couple of years during World War I. Thanks for listening, and now we go back to our regularly scheduled video. Off. So uh, just bear with me on that. But uh, it disappeared when everything just became the United States Army. So just kind of a neat early armband. And then what I really liked about it is on the back side here, let's see if we can get this to kind of come up on the camera. It's hard to see. Um, you're not going to be able to read it. But it does have a nice quartermaster stamp on the back side, which I really like because it kind of lends a little more authenticity to it. So just a neat piece. Um, they're out there, not in great quantity, but I like this kind of early World War I material. Moving on, we have this just salty World War I uh, uh, enlisted man's cap. I believe by looking at the material of this cap, it's a very different material from what you see in the standard Doughboy World War I overseas caps. I believe this is theater made. It was probably French made. It might be possibly German made, hard to tell. Um, but it is a theater made cap. And I like it because the saltiness, the wear, etc., is not from you know pro improper storage or from abuse. It's from just being worn every day by the soldier. It's just, it's got that look that just called out to me. Um, a couple other things I liked about it is you can see like here in the front where the soldier did some tacking to make it fit better. I like the fact that inside of it here, if we zoom in here, you can see that it's a Sergeant Moore, Sergeant J.R. Moore with his serial number. So I like that he put it in there so it's an ID'd cap. But then what also is really cool is if we look inside of this, and you'll have to excuse me, I'm doing this one-handed. Um, you can see right here where the cap was safety pinned. And a lot of the doughboys, they did not like these overseas caps because the top was often open. And it would just kind of flop around. I mean, they are not the most attractive caps. These are not like the World War II overseas caps that are a little more rakish, a little more stylish. These things, man, when you wore them, they looked horrible. So a lot of the doughboys went about kind of altering the cap, and they would do that by either sewing the top closed or they would pin it closed. So this particular sergeant pinned the top of his cap closed to give it a little bit more rakish look. So, you know, the piece is in solid condition. It's not in the best condition. There is staining to it. There is a little bit of wear to it. But it just called out to me. It was one of those pieces that's just, it's been there, it's done that, and it just is cool. So I'm happy to add this to my collection. Now we'll move up the food chain here to the 1920s. And I've always wanted to own one of these. What you have here is you have, uh, it's a World War I style officer's map case, but it's during that transitional period in our country's history. So it's during that period of the 1920s. And in fact, if we flip it over here on the back side, you can see that it's got a really nice um, quartermaster stamp 
Jefferson Barracks, its quartermaster corps, and it's dated 1921. You can also see we have this nice stamping here for uh, Lieutenant Rhodes and then Lisowski. So two different people use this map case. Um, it is U.S. Uh, this is in the, the British style. If you look at British map cases of the time, it does look like a British map case, but this is clearly a U.S. map case. And you can see here that uh, this back flap opens. There's a pocket here to put things in. Plus, there are these pencil slots for pens and pencils, etc. And then when we flip it over to the front, it's got this uh, flap here, and then it's got this closure here. And when you open those up, this allows you to open up the case. There's a nice piece of felt in here to protect the map grid. But now you've got a map grid for your map. Um, you can use grease pencil on this or what have you. It does have a little bit of damage, and it's not really damage. It's where the seam has popped. So that could be restored if desired. But um, to me, it does not bother me. It's just part of the history of this piece. And then down here, you also have another flip it up here, you have another snap, and by undoing this snap, it allows you then to slide your map into the grid. So it's a really neat piece from that time period uh, between the wars. And I like it because I think it will look nice on display with one of my 1917 A1 helmets. So it's got the original uh, strap on here, so it is complete. Um, and it's just a really cool piece. I've been looking one for looking for one for a while, and uh, they don't come up that often. So when I found it there, a little, little bit of uh, wear on it up here. There's a little bit of staining, but it, it's nothing that, that caused me you know, great concern. I like it. So Now, moving into World War II, we have a small pickup here. Uh, China, Burma, India, uh, shoulder insignia. This one I like. It's got the material on the back here. Uh, pretty much just a common piece, but I have uh, now I think about a half a dozen of these, maybe a few more. And when I find one that I don't have or a style that I don't have, I try to pick up. So hence why I purchased this one. Nice little CBI insignia. Um, we have this scary mask right here. And this is another piece I've been looking for for a while and you don't see them out there that often at the shows. Uh, what this is, it's a United States Navy cold weather or extreme cold weather um, mask. I'm trying to get it to open up here and it's not, it's fighting me. So pretty hideous, isn't it? <laughs> you got the eye holes, you've got a nose cover here which can be snapped open. Um, you have a mouth cover here and it, there are holes or perforations in there to breathe through and then it also can be snapped open. Um, you have the various straps here to wear it over your head. Um, these also can be un, this side sewn in, but if you come over to this side, uh, these are actually snapped on so you can adjust them and then just leave them snapped. And then when you want to put it on, just unsnap and then put it on versus having to take off or unbuckle it. Uh, and then it's got a neck guard down here so you could tuck it into your sweater, coat, whatever you were wearing. Um, we know this is World War II and we know this is Navy by the markings here on the inside. We zoom in here. Let's see. You can get that. You can see U.S. Navy contract uh, NXSX and the number. If you look up that contract number, and this is a good tip for you. If you have Navy contract numbers, you can look them up. There's a really great database on the U.S. Military Forum. And all you have to do is put in a you know, search like uh, Navy contract number lookup and you'll find it. Um, but you can look at that and it gives a breakdown of the Navy contract numbers. So by looking this one up, um, I know this mask was made in mid-1943, which is really cool. Because when you first look at it, I mean, it looks like maybe a piece of sports equipment. It looks like something that, uh, you know, maybe was made, you know, in the 70s or the 80s. It doesn't look World War II. Um, I knew what it was the moment I saw it underneath a pile of stuff. I was like, oh, that's one of those cold weather masks. I am going to buy it. So the final thing to share with you is this uh, just standard United States Army officer's cap. Um, I picked this one up because I loved 
the color of the visor. It's hard to see on the camera here, but the visor is almost a brown black mix. Um, it's just beautiful. It's so rich. I thought at first it was bad aging on the visor, but then the chin strap is that same color. So just a very rich cap. Uh, it's got a beautiful um, uh, Officer's Eagle on here. The Officer's Eagle is marked on the back Amcraft, an acid test. So it is a World War II um, you know, device, very pretty. And then on the inside here, it's got a very nice um, maker's mark inside of it there. It's the uh, Chancellor Company, I believe, uh, Headmaster, Kaysen, just a nice, um, Nice marking. The only drawback to this hat, if you look here, you can see that it is missing the interior leather sweatband, unfortunately. But that does not detract from the hat. And it's just a beautiful hat. It's the Melton wool top. There are a few um, nips in it. But overall, it was unusual enough that I decided to, you know, make that leap and purchase it. And that's something I want to share with you about this show. It was kind of fascinating in that there wasn't a whole lot of field gear. There were some cartridge belts. There were some pistol belts. Um, no canteens. Well, I shouldn't say that. There were I saw three World War II canteens, and just the quality wasn't worth me purchasing them because I went looking for a canteen. Um, headgear like this, not there. Just not there. So I don't know if this type of stuff is starting to dry up or what's going on you know these pieces right here came from a young man who is a world war one collector and he was just deciding to kind of um move some pieces on because they just didn't fit in his collection anymore so you know i'm happy to add them to mine but yeah it was strange that stuff that you used to see all the time just it just wasn't there um so i don't know if that's indicative of what's you know going on it's stuff drying up now, as far as Costco, I know people like to know uh, what stuff, uh, you know, what I paid for items just to get an idea of what stuff is selling for. So I will give you a breakdown. And before I do that, I just want to remind everybody that remember what you pay for something. Don't, don't get yourself caught up in the value as far as, well, they're selling on eBay for this or, you know, whatever. Yes, eBay is a good tool as far as their realized auctions to give you a ballpark. So in other words, like if this insignia right here is selling on eBay, they're averaging about $10, and you're at the show and one is selling for $50, that's just the same exact one on eBay that's selling for, you know, between $10, $15. Yeah, that kind of gives you an idea that maybe you want to wait. But I think people get so caught up in eBay and how much stuff is selling for and how much it's worth that they feel they get ripped off if they don't pay what's being you know realized on eBay. Buy the stuff you like. If you see something and you really like it, buy it because the other problem with eBay and using it as a comparison is stuff, there's variations. Like this hat right here, I mean, I can look up overseas caps on eBay, you know, World War I overseas caps, but it's not going to give me, you know, French made with Sergeant, um, uh, I can't think of the name, Sergeant Moore's name in it. You know, if you like it, go for it, you know, have fun. So the prices, I like to give you just as an example of what's being paid. So um, I spent a little more than I wanted to at uh, the show, but just to give you an idea, cap paid $20 armband I paid twenty dollars just because it was unusual and I thought it was it was worth it and the gentleman had more but he was willing to deal uh, this insignia I paid ten dollars which yeah it's a little bit more than I like to pay for it but you know I mean not much more you know so it was worth it um, well let's skip the map case uh, the face mask was a great deal at ten dollars the hat was a little more pricey this ran thirty dollars um, and I thought even with the missing sweatband, it was worth it. It's once again, a beautiful hat, interesting variation. And heck, the f cap device on this hat is worth about mm, $20, $25. So, you know, there you go. And then the map case, that's where it got expensive. The map case was a C-note. It was $100 for the map case, um, but you just don't see them. 
And when you look at World War II map cases, they are selling in that range of $75, you know, $50, $75. So depending on condition and such. So I didn't think it was bad to spend $100. And as I said, you just don't see them. You know, I've been looking on eBay for one like this, and they're just not there. Um, so I made that choice to pull the trigger, and it was fun. <laughs> That's all that matters. So use these prices for whatever, but just remember, when you're shopping, have fun. Buy the stuff that you like. So this is Steve with Keep Em Rolling, and we're going to end the video there. I hope to have more recent Vine videos. I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon because, as I said, we look like we're going into maybe another type of lockdown situation. So who knows where things will be, but at least I've had some fun and have been able to find some things I can add to my collection. So on that note, everybody, this is Steve with Keep Em Rolling, reminding all of you to please stay safe, stay strong, and keep them rolling.